the 2023 recruiting class is all but wrapped up, but we're moving on to 2024, and joining me today will be John Garcia here on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Joining me now for Locked On Gators is John Garcia, Locked On's recruiting insider. And before we get into 2024 talk, I'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash Locked On College. Terms and conditions apply. And we're starting off with Adarius Hayes, who has gotten quite a bit of conversation lately from Florida Gators fans on social media. They're all talking about him. We've talked about him before, uh, but he's listed most places as an edge, almost exclusively listing him there. But when you watch the tape, he's almost exclusively playing off ball, if not always exclusively playing off ball. So is that more of a projection thing for a Darius Hayes? And even then, how do you go about projecting that from off ball linebacker to edge? Because this isn't the same as going from tackle to guard or even like corner to safety still is an easy one, but it's, I feel like it's easier than going from off ball player to on the line of scrimmage every single down. Yeah. It's one of those where you kind of understand both sides of the equation on, on the front end. Obviously look, Adarius Hayes is comfortable playing off ball linebacker. That's where he's been most of his life. His program at Largo allows him to kind of seek and destroy it and be the focal point of that defense. So you understand the high school's perspective there as well. But then on the flip side, you you turn on the tape and you see this great length, right? He looks like a flex tight end at times. Uh, He lists himself at six foot four. So even if he's being generous there, this is about the length. Um, You can look at any photo of him from the last 12 to 18 months and just say, wow, this is a guy who you would imagine once he bulks up, will be able to play a variety of positions. And the most conventional at a 6'4", 230-pound build is going to be on the edge. And, and I think the combination of that and his athleticism probably uh, creates some imaginatory moves uh, for those in, in the business. And colleges are kind of in between, too. You know, I think that's the beauty of this time of year. Juniors are becoming seniors. We're, we're, we're getting a better in-person look at these guys. And the colleges are on the road right now. Of course, they'll have another round of, of trips all over the country come spring football in the state of Florida in particular, where these guys are, are suited up and in pads and ready to go. So I think all those boards will shift a little bit uh, from that position projection when they do get a fresher look at Hayes, who has said, by the way, he's most comfortable playing off ball. Um, and I know at Florida – the comp for him, at least via his words, is Ventro Miller. That's kind of the role that he's envisioning. He even mentioned playing alongside Miles Graham in the box. So, you know, from Florida's perspective and from Adarius's perspective, it's a whole lot of off-ball conversation. Although the frame, the look, the feel, conventional wisdom with that tells you maybe he develops into an edge before all is said and done. And I feel like Florida's always in the mix for one of these guys. Um, just over the last, just in my experience, I mean, the, the Jeremiah moons, the Muhammad Diabates, I mean, these guys were, came up as one position and you project them for another. And sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. So I think Hayes is, is in that mold of, of kind of those two where you could see him rushing the passer eventually, but really he's most comfortable in, in the role he's in off the ball in space with that, that ability to, to seek and destroy and really come downhill. Yeah, uh, I hate when people do the, the Ventro Miller comparison, mainly because even if play style wise, they're perfectly the same. I feel like the intangibles for Ventro is like something that you like. I've yeah. said it multiple times, like when you think of Ventro Miller, like I feel like I think like Florida again, like, like he is a gator through and through. And so I feel I just hate it. Just like on a personal point, like, <laughs> like I love his play style. Play style could be great, but I just I hate it just from that point of view. But you know, you mentioned off ball, Florida sees him off ball. Uh, he compared himself to Ventrell or like, that's the tape he's been watching. The role, yeah. The role, yeah. not, not a height and weight thing yeah. there. Yeah. Um, but can Florida fans kind of also take note that 
inside linebackers coach Jay Bateman is listed as his primary recruiter. Is that kind of an indicator of his role as opposed to, you know, outside linebacker coach Mike Peterson, who works with the edge rushers? 100%. I mean, this is especially when it's in state. You know, you really want to kind of nail that one early on in terms of what the projection is going to be, who's going to own the recruitment, whatever it may be. So I do think it's an indicator. And again, look, all of this is fluid. I think that's important to to bring up, even though it should be assumed at this point. All of it's fluid. We don't know what what the body's going to turn into over the next year or so. But right now, yeah, I think all indication from Florida's perspective and Adarius's is, is that he wants to, to be an off-ball backer. And then that's what Florida is selling him on at this point. So if it changes, I think he'll be open to it. It's not one of these, you know, some of these kids are like, I'm only this. And if it's anything else, don't recruit me. Like Nicholas Harbour's like, don't recruit me on defense right now. It's it's not quite that with a, a Darius. And there are some overlapping uh, features. Um, you're, you're working downhill most mostly at both of these spots. But obviously mentally, uh, I think most importantly, there are some very stark differences between the two as well. So I think that's something that everybody's just kind of working with slowly in that conversation. Because again, there's still about at least a year before Hayes gets on any college campus. Although it should be mentioned that Florida is absolutely, absolutely the leader and in a great spot here. Yeah. It's also interesting with a player like Adarius, because if you're talking about someone that's an off ball linebacker going to play edge, this Florida defense seems like a great spot for that because they drop their pass, their edge rushers into coverage so frequently that it's like, well, if you're comfortable off ball and you like moving around off ball, you're going to get to do that. Even though you're an edge rusher here, you kind of get to do it all. But I feel, I feel like that should be a good selling point for someone like our Darius, but also on the defensive side of the ball, Charles Lester, the third released his top five uh, and Florida was in it. But before we even talk about the other people in that top five, uh, who is Charles Lester the third, just as a player right now? This is a phenomenal kind of classic Floridian two-way star. Uh, I think every cycle we see a handful of these guys that you really have a hard time projecting from a side of the ball standpoint, which is a great situation uh, for Lester. Uh, he could legitimately be a wide receiver one type candidate, or he could be an elite corner. Um, we got to see him play both, of course, over the weekend at the battle seven on in Miami uh, playing with South Florida express and all those absurd skill position players that they have worked at corner worked incredibly well. He's so comfortable competing at the line of scrimmage and that receiver background really helps him when the ball is in the air. So I, I think the receiver corner conversation is one that always breaks the corners way all things even. Cause you're like, look more money over there, more upside over there. There's a, a billion receivers. There's only a million corners in theory. Um, so I do think it probably ends up on that side of the ball, but, but he's so dynamic that you just, you don't want to pigeonhole him at this point. Um, and I don't think that's a big deal for him either. Kind of like, Hey, he's, he's open to both sides, but I do think as time has gone on here, we're seeing a little bit more of a defensive focus, especially from the schools involved in on the kid. And I think that's always a good indicator. It's, it's one thing for the recruit to say what he's preferring, but like, Hey, tell me which coaches are recruiting you. You know, if like Kirby smart and Saban are like personally on the cases here, like they are with Lester, it's probably more of a defensive situation or defensive back situation. So I do think that's probably where he ends up, but yeah, he's, he's a phenomenal dynamic player, um, competitive, has that edge to him that you expect from, from sunshine state prospects. Um, but he could really project on either side of the ball. And that's why, I mean, you mentioned the top five. I mean, it's, it's loaded. It's the best of the best. Clemson's trying to work its way in this weekend when he takes a visit out there. So that will be one of those spotlight recruits for Florida. Hey, you you want to elevate the perception. You want to continue this trend. This is one of those recruitments that you kind of got to win or at least hang in until the end. Right. Tampa kid, um, a, a guy who who conventionally Florida has been able to do very well with uh, from a geographical standpoint. But uh, there's a long way to go in the recruitment, to say the least. Yeah, and kind of uh, with a long way to go, but a top five already released. How should Florida feel about it at this point? Because this is one of those battles, again, like it's not national, it's regional plus Ohio State, which is how a lot of things have gone with Florida yeah. kids lately, it, it yep. feels like. Uh, but how should Florida feel this early? It, it, it's weird because like I know it's early in the game, but he's got a top five out. And so I feel like that makes it later, but still plenty of time to go. Yeah, they should feel good, Florida fans. Um, this, this is a kid, he, he was just on campus within the last week or so, also visited Florida State. I mean, those two 
you feel like are going to stay in it until the end, no matter what. I think it's really about those other schools, right? Clemson's getting this visit this weekend. Can they crash the party? Can they become a school that knocks out one of the other schools in this top five? If that happens, I don't think Florida is at risk to be that school that gets sort of bumped out. Or maybe he just goes political and says, hey, now it's a top six. And they're just they're just added. No, no one's bumped out. But look, when Bama and Georgia and these schools, Ohio State are involved for any kid anywhere, it's a it's a tough recruitment. It's one that you're going to have to push all the right buttons with. And I do think to this point, Florida has been able to do that. Um, they're recruiting him as a corner. Corey Raymond's on that case. You guys, your audience by now knows how I feel about Corey Raymond. Charles has reciprocated those thoughts. I think he even called him the cornerback goat specifically recently, which is, you know, um, we, we throw around goat too much, I think, these days. But, you know, Corey Raymond's got a, a stake in that conversation. And that's something that Charles already recognizes. Corey has already latched onto him as a priority recruit. And Charles knows it. And I think that's a big deal, too. Knowing you're a priority for that guy it is a big deal. So I, I think Florida's going to stay in this race for quite some time. Again, they just got a trip. I think they'll get a couple more before this thing is all said and done. I don't think he's talking officials much yet. So maybe he takes them later in the cycle, summer, or even into the fall. Uh, but even in that case, you, you expect Florida to, to hang around and, and stay in the mix. Really, for now, I think Lester's recruitment, it's about that top five. Who who can sneak in? Does Clemson sneak in? How do the out-of-state, out-of-region schools perform uh, in the next few months? I think that will be telling, but you expect – the two end state schools, Florida and Florida State, to hang around, you know, more likely than not. The NFL playoffs are here, and we here at Locked On, including myself a lot, are really excited about our new sports betting partner because it's the number one sports book in America. It's FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy, whether that's First baskets in the NBA, Evan Mobley and Kyle Lowry. Thank you so much for, I think it was Thursday. Really appreciate that. Or each team will score a touchdown and field goal in each half. Thank you, Jags and Chiefs. Just saying, it's free. And I don't know about you, but betting Josh Allen and Joe Mixon both to score a touchdown parlayed from Sunday's game made Sunday a fantastic afternoon for me. New customers can join, place a $5 bet, and receive $150 in free bets, whether you win or lose. Sign up at fanduel.com slash locked on. And on the offensive side of the ball, Florida's had a few visits from running backs lately, but we'll start off with Anthony Carey. Who is Anthony Carey as a running back and, and his style? Very modern style. A guy who um, who profiles, look, he's, I don't know what he's officially listed, 5'10", 185, let's say. So he profiles as a space and, and scat type of back. But, you know, he's got some in-between-the-tackles ability uh, coming out of Tampa, Florida. But he's also got this third down ability that's really intriguing. That's something that you, when you talk about a modern back, you've got to be able to work on third down as, as a blocker, as a receiver, or both. Uh, and I think Kerry can do a, a lot of those things. So, you know, Florida's already selling him on that sort of dual role. And that's something that he really likes. He wants to be known as, as a very modern back who can go out and run routes if you need him to. Uh, so that's, that is exactly how he profiles. Um, very explosive in space, uh, can absolutely make you miss, has enough top end speed to outrun, you know, Florida natives, which is a big deal uh, when you do get to the third level there. Um, so, so he's a, a really intriguing player that a lot of folks are looking at as a complement to that conventional in this case, SEC style of running back. If you think about what, what Florida's got on its roster right now, it's very conventional SEC in the backfield. So this is a counter a little bit to that. Even bringing in Trayon Webb um, in the 23 class, still a little bit more conventional, right? Downhill, physical, kid who's who's going to be able to, to get better as the game progresses. I think an Anthony Carey could be a nice complement to that style of running back. So you can see why Florida's not only recruiting him, but why they're absolutely in the mix. And Florida has also been pushing for Stacey Gage in the backfield. So similar question. What is, what is he like in his style and how does he fit in? Yeah, I think he's built more conventionally. Uh, like we talked about ETN and, and these guys, uh, Johnson as well. Um, but he has some modern ability beyond that. He just doesn't look like it. He's, he's sawed off, you know, 5'9", 210. Looks like he's ready for SEC carries right now. Uh, but, you know, he's he's working on that that other element of his game to balance out a little bit more. But, man, uh, in between the tackles, downhill, 
he's fun. Uh, he can stick his foot in the ground and, and really pick up yardage with leverage. Uh, and then he's got some nice moves. I remember against um, American Heritage a couple of years ago at IMG, um, it was two SEC signees converging on him. He spun at the five and, and ended up, you know, walking in untouched. I mean, he's he's got some real playmaking ability within um, his his big kind of classic frame. So he's another exciting back that is going to project a little bit more balance compared to what we currently see on on this Gator roster. And that's another one. That's another heavyweight recruitment, right? It's it's USC. It's Georgia. Um, Oklahoma's always been involved in this recruitment as well. He has roots out there. So this one is much more national than some of these other kids that, that we've talked about. And, and he'll kind of go through the full gamut and take a bunch of official visits as well. So naturally for Florida, can you grab one of those? Can you stay in the mix in that regard? Um, because stacy has been busy with visits and transfers. He's uh, gone from IMG to Tampa Wharton and now from Tampa Wharton to St. Thomas Aquinas down in Fort Lauderdale. So not only would that be big for Florida just because Stacey Gage is really good, but obviously anytime you can tap into that STA pipeline, it's a very big deal in this state. Yeah, and for Florida specifically, you look at this past offseason, you lost Naquan Wright to South Florida. You lost Lorenzo Lingard to Akron. So you lost two backs in the transfer portal. You brought in one running back in Trayon Webb for 2023. You have Chauncey Bowens committed for 2024, but what is the importance of adding another running back to a room where you have Montreal for at least this year, but he could be gone, Trevor Etienne for at least two years, but he could be gone after that, and then Treyon, where, where you're looking very top-heavy in the running back room in Gainesville right now. That you said it, right? You need depth. You, you need depth, and I think you need some variance. I think you need some guys who present a different challenge to some of these defenses, even though this Florida running game was was the absolute you know, best end of what we saw from UF in 2022. You do, you do need to restock that, that room because, yeah, at this point, um, with, the, with the carries and the production to Johnson's name, you'd be surprised if he was around in 24. And then, obviously, the trajectory of ETN is, is even better. So in that regard, um, you, you're going to be rotating you know, lead backs year in, year out. So you've got to not only bring in different styles, but I think you need volume. I think you need at least two backs. I wouldn't even be shocked if Florida brings in three in this class of 24, especially if one of them really is a true dual threat, like, like a Scooter Carey, who could legitimately wind up as a receiver, help you in the return game, some things like that. So um, it's absolutely paramount. I think it's it's obviously early for Florida in this 24 cycle, but if you're starting to, at least from where I sit on the outside looking in, if you're starting to think about priority spots, running back has, has got to be one. So one, it's good that they've got one on the board and, and Chauncey, who's a really good balanced back, a guy who who's getting hotter as time progresses. I know Bama just offered there. And then the volume in state, right? Stacey Gage is in state, carries in state. There's some other talented backs in, in the state of Florida that could get some looks down the line. You like that situation where you've got one and you're looking to pair him with, with at least one or two and they're all semi-local. I mean, that that's an ideal spot for Billy Napier and company trying to attack this position. But I do think you need some volume there. Yeah, and I know that one of the things that we've spoken about a lot since you started coming on Lockdown Gators was how things look on the field. Like we talked about it for Florida, where you can watch the defense. And if you're a recruit, you can go, oh, I could play early here or, or <laughs> whatever it might be. But if you're someone like Anthony Carey, who you're you know, a modern dual threat type of running back, does Florida's tape from 2022 not worry you, but kind of disincentivize you, I guess? Because in 2021, Naquan Wright was one of the best pass catching backs in the SEC. And then in 2022, he was non existent, as were all running backs in the passing attack. So is that a situation where you go, well, if they're not going to use me that way, that worries me? Or is it maybe the coaching staff going, we didn't have someone that we wanted to use that yeah, way. It's that part, you know, especially when you talk about a confident Floridian like like a scooter carry. That's how that's going to be sold and received from from his end. Like, hey, um, you guys ran the ball so well, you just didn't have somebody quite like me. Uh, look, the offense was different, right? Still, still young, developing the AR and all that stuff. So it'll already look different, in my opinion. Um, in in twenty three, I do think the backs get more involved naturally um but yeah that'll always be a selling point you know and in, in recruiting there's always a sell either hey come help us do what we do so well or hey 
come help us do the thing you do so well that we don't quite have. I mean, that can you can talk about that from for any program's perspective. So I do think it's it's still a strong point for Florida, and it's not going to detract a guy like Kerry from from considering UF. And to wrap up this episode, we're going to talk about the, the trenches, which we surprisingly haven't really done. Uh, it's been a big focal point lately, but we haven't done that yet. But Jake Guarnera is someone who's been on campus a few times for Florida now, but who is he as a player? He's a nice player up at Ponte Vedra, a guy who, who plays tackle. Well, he's played some guard. I think he's going to project inside at the next level. I, I think some schools are even talking center at this point, 6'4", 285. So he's got this frame that is about where you want it for an interior guy as a junior in high school, one that you're not going to have to trim a bunch of weight off of. If anything, you might need to add some weight to the frame. But I think his game translates inside as well, Brandon. He is very good at the point of attack. He's a leverage guy. He's not going to floor you with his length or his pass blocking ability just yet, although he is certainly serviceable at the prep level. He's a guy who wants to come downhill um, and, and set the tone at the point of contact. And that's not only what Florida has done so well under Billy Napier, that's that's what they now need on the roster. So whether it's center or guard, I think he's a, a true interior projection. He'll probably be about 300 pounds by the time he signs with, with his program of choice. And that's really where his strength is, you know, you know, at the point of contact, low leverage and that drive thereafter. So enhancing those strengths, I think, will only – up his value and, and he's kind of one of those that you know the more you watch him the more you like him because his his floor his strengths are right there right now as opposed to something that you have to you know, develop into down the line yeah and he is someone who has taken five unofficials to florida already yeah. he's also taken five unofficials to nc state now nc state is the only other school that he's gone to in 2023 for a visit other than florida so how should Florida fans feel? Or at this point, we have no idea when he's going to commit. That's not a thing that he's discussed or anything. But how should Florida fans feel? Because and I don't know if this is me reaching, but if I'm looking at his visits and I see, okay, he's been to Florida and NC State five times each. He hasn't been to any other school since early, mid-November. He's been just Florida, just NC State. I, I feel like Florida's a leader early on, at least. So is that something where Florida fans can go, okay, like, like we're a finalist here as, as it stands right now? Yeah, I don't think he's come out and said Florida's right there at number one. But yeah, the the you track what the kids do more than they say, right, at this stage. And, and he's certainly shown considerable interest at UF. Look, Gators are about to have a round one interior guy. You know, I think all of that really helps. Um, and then conversely, NC State uh, made a coaching change at the offensive line spot. Um, their offense is going to look a lot different in 23. So maybe that tells you that there's some time left in this recruitment. In addition to the fact, like you said, B, that he hasn't visited other schools and he's still getting offers. Miami just offered Penn State's in it, a couple other schools. So, you know, he wants to get to some of these other campuses before a decision comes in. But from Florida's perspective, sooner the better. You know, it's it's been a much more clear kind of linear recruitment in that regard. In-state kid, very close to campus. Uh, a position of need every single cycle. I think you need volume on on the old line in 24 for sure, because in 23 it's it was kind of up and down at the position or at the position group, I should say. Uh, so yeah, sooner the better if he does want to make a commitment. But conventionally, you think he's going to try to get to some of these schools before all of that uh, goes down for sure. But even then, I think Florida is going to be right at the thick and, and then maybe at the top of of this race uh, until until he actually comes off the board. Yeah, and before I let you go, I feel like it's a little, not not weird, but it's unsurprising when a Florida kid takes five unofficials to Florida. Like, like kids nearby do that a ton where they just go, okay, like, it's nearby. I get to go to that campus and do whatever I want and, and go take the visit there, considering how easy it is to do for him location-wise. But that same kid taking also five unofficials all the way up at NC State not not is it weird but is that a little uh unique we'll say to, to see someone where it's like okay i'm taking visits to a local school and then a bunch also to a very not local school yeah it is unique you know i i don't have the knowledge of if he's got some family ties up there i know his his dad played up at rutgers so he's got some mid-atlantic uh big east old school ties uh, up up your way um but yeah, uh, it is a little bit unique uh, in this in this regard, especially when 
you look at some of the other schools in the mix that haven't gotten a visit that are as far as NC State or somewhere in between the drive from from Florida to NC State. So I, I do think that's quite interesting. Um, again, if if it does become an accelerated recruitment, you feel great about Florida and probably decent about NC State and and crappy if you're the other schools in, in the conversation to to this point. Uh, but look. NC State's gone over some some changes. Um, again, we mentioned the O-line coach uh, change that that went over there as well. So I know some of that is is very businesslike. Hey, let's go sit down with with the new potential position coach and, and see what that looks like um, in addition to games and all that fun stuff. So, so we'll see. I, I think the spring travel schedule will be pr- pretty telling uh, for this kid. And then, you know, it's official visit season sooner than, than, than we think, right? You can get into – spring official visits here in the next couple of months. So if those begin to to get used towards some of these other programs, I do think this thing will feel a lot of, a lot more conventional. But yeah, right now it, it is a little bit odd to see not only a Gators versus Wolfpack battle, but the fact that the visit slate is even for a kid uh, not very far away from Gainesville. Yeah, that is unique for sure. And I think t- time will tell if that's telling or just kind of a coincidence. Thank you so much, John. This is John Garcia, Locked On's Recruiting Insider. Four weeks now, by the way. We're four weeks in a row uh, for 2023. We got you. We're going to keep it going. Just 48 more. You know, it's easy stuff, but thank you so much, John. Catch them all throughout the Locked On College channel and every week on Locked On Gators. Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we're available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Florida Gators. For your second listen, check out Locked On SEC, hosted by Chris Gordy of Sports 790. Get the best coverage on the best conference, including the best university, the University of Florida. For Locked On Gators, I'm Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with Whole9Sports and GiantsCountryFSI.com, and I'll see you all tomorrow.